Hi guys, it's Mary McIntyre here. Welcome to another video. This is the first in a series of videos that I've been wanting to put together for a really long time. And it's going to be talking about atmospheric optics. And there are so many different atmospheric optical effects that you can see if you have the right conditions. And once you know that they exist, you start to see them because they're there very commonly. So I'm going to break it down into a series of videos first. And I'm going to start off this video just talking about some of the really common ones, just so that you have an idea really of what you're seeing. Um, because so often I see people referring to things by the wrong name. Um, this is one of my most popular talk subjects, so I've kind of delved really deep into this subject and researched it quite extensively over the past few years. But I'm not going to go into that level of detail that I do in my talk. I just want to give you the absolute basics so that you know what to look for. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, keep watching. Don't forget to hit the like button. So I'm going to talk about these effects each in turn and I'm going to put a photograph up here when I um, refer to each thing so that you'll have an idea of what to look for. So number one on the list is a corona. So here's a corona. And if you see these kind of concentric rings of colour immediately around the sun or the moon or even just patches of cloud that have that kind of pastel colour in them, that is a corona or iridescent clouds. They, they are both essentially the same thing. They are caused by water droplets. So it's diffraction of light through water droplets in cloud that is at a lower level and therefore is water droplets rather than ice. So that's the only one of the effects I'm talking about in this video that is caused by diffraction of water droplets. Everything else is ice crystals. So number two, 22 degree halo. A 22 degree halo, as the name suggests, extends out from the sun 22 degrees each side. So if you don't know how to measure that, put your arm out at arm's length, spread your hand out, and if you put your thumb on the sun, the kind of width of your hand at arm's length is roughly 25 degrees. So a halo will kind of, both thumbs on the sun, it will be like a ring around the sun. You may just see fragments of it, but usually it's a, an entire ring. And this is the first of the atmospheric optical effects that are actually refraction through ice crystals. These ice crystals are hexagonal and the light gets refracted in there when it goes into the crystal and then it gets refracted again when it comes out. So that deviates the light by 22 degrees, which is why the halo is at 22 degrees. There's a bit of colour separation. The inner edge is always red. The outer edge tends to be more blue. And this is by far the most common atmospheric optical effect. You can see these like 250 times a year if you're avidly looking for them. You basically need cirrostratus cloud, which can either just be there on its own or be at the edge of weather fronts. So you could have halos before a new weather front comes in or as one moves away. It depends which direction it's um, the, the weather's moving in at any time. The reason they're so common is because they don't need any special alignment. All you need is those hexagonalized crystals and they just need to be there. They need to be a good enough quality to pr create a halo and basically that will form a halo. So you don't need anything special really. The conditions are very basic and that is why they are far and away the most common atmospheric optical effect. So if you see that it is not a rainbow around the sun, it's nothing to do with rain at all, it's refraction through ice crystals. Now all of the ice crystal effects that I'm talking about in this video can be seen around the sun or the moon. With the moon you need the moon to be more than half lit so from kind of first quarter or right the way through the gibbous phase full moon down to last quarter that is the kind of level of reflected light from the moon that is enough to cause these atmospheric optical effects. So this is a picture of a moon halo. The colours are generally a little bit more muted but if you've got a, a kind of gibbous moon visible that night and you've seen a halo during the day make sure you go out that night and have a look because you may see something around the moon as well just a little side note this is not a moonbow a moonbow is caused by rain it's the same as a rainbow but caused by moonlight this is not a moonbow it's a 22 degree halo so make sure you don't mix up those terms 
So next on the list is something called an upper tangent arc and they're often seen at the same time as the halo but they're sometimes present as like just a brighter smudge at the top and lower tangent arc is at the bottom of the halo. So they're kind of touching the halo but you just get this smudge that's brighter. When the sun is low and you've got good conditions, you sometimes get this kind of V-shaped winged sort of structure. That's just basically because the upper tangent arc will change shape depending on where the sun is. So if the sun's low down, you get the, the V shape with the wings. When the sun gets higher up, that flattens out and starts to wrap around the top of the halo. So they look really different, even though they are essentially the same thing. And it's basically just to do with sun altitude. A 22 degree halo stays exactly the same and stays circular regardless of how high or low the sun is. But the upper tangent arc will change dramatically with solar altitude. And that leads me on to the next thing, which is a circumscribed halo. And these form usually when the sun's a little bit higher, but it's when the ice crystals that cause upper and lower tangent arcs are, are present in a good quantity and the alignment is good, you end up with the lower tangent arc coming out and the upper tangent arc coming around the top and they actually meet out at the sides. When the sun's high, like really high, the upper and lower tangent arcs can form a circumscribed halo that is perfectly round and sitting directly on top of the 22 degree halo. So you can't tell whether you're seeing a halo or a circumscribed halo. But when the sun's a bit lower, it comes out in more of an oval shape and you can kind of see the oval shape as well as the round shape. And then when that gets a bit lower, it extends out and forms these little kind of ears around the outside edge. So it's not often that you see an entire circumscribed halo, but they are worth looking for in the summer when the sun's a bit higher. If you just see one of the tangent arcs, that is not a circumscribed halo. It's only a circumscribed when they meet and actually form a complete halo that is around the outside of the 22 degree halo. So the final thing I'm going to talk about in this video is sun dogs, or to give them their correct name, parhelia, from the Greek Germanic word meaning beside the sun. And I love sun dogs, and they're another one that is incredibly common. But a sun dog is not the whole circle around the sun. It's a separate thing. And you get these little smudges that look like miniature rainbows. Again, nothing to do with rain. There's no water involved here. This is all ice crystals. But they, when the sun is really high they can't form at all. So when the sun goes above 60 degrees, you can't get sun dogs. But once it gets lower than that, the sun dogs will be kind of up and outside of the halo. You will see a distinct gap around the outside of the halo where the sun dog is sitting. As the sun gets lower, the sun dogs get lower and closer. And so when we most commonly see sun dogs, which is when the sun is kind of near setting, purely because it's easier to look at it then, it's not as bright, you can then get those those bright rainbow smudges pretty much sitting on top of the halo but you don't always get a halo at the same time they're caused by different ice crystals halos are caused by column ice crystals sun dogs are caused by flat plate ones so sometimes you get both if you've got both types of crystal present but sometimes you just get the sun dog crystals so there will just be isolated little smudges of rainbow basically with vertical color separation red on the inside near the sun blue on the outside but they can kind of have very different morphologies and that's why I find them really fascinating. Sometimes when the sun is very low the wobbly atmosphere causes um, sun dogs to kind of elongate into a tall column but other times a sun dog can be kind of really flat and elongated so they're really interesting because no two are ever really identical but you do see them with halos sometimes you see them without the name sun dog basically comes from the mythologies around sky gods having loyal either twin sons or dogs that will follow the sun in a loyal way and actually the history of um, parhelia and mythology can be traced back through many civilizations around the world 
and cave cave paintings, just different stories. And there's a, a really famous one um, in the Battle of Mortimer's Cross where there was an apparition that made it into a Shakespeare play. So it's um, there's a lot of really interesting history there. So this is a picture of some moon dogs. Uh, the proper name is Paracelini or singular Paracelene. Generally, I find you need an almost full moon to see these. And again, they're one of those things, once you know to look for them, they're there. And there is a bit of colour visible in them sometimes if you get a really good um, good ice crystals, a good bright moon and really prominent moon dogs. The colours generally are never going to be as bright as you get around the sun, but they're still so, so beautiful. And I tend to notice them more when the moon is quite low, but that's probably because I don't sit out and watch the moon all night long the way that I quite often do on a sunny day. So definitely look out for them. If you've had the ice crystals causing sun dogs during the day, there's a good chance that if you're near a full moon or some we're close to that you may get um, moon dogs that night so keep an eye out for those and here's a picture of a bit close up of one of these moon dogs just so you can see the the subtle colors there they're really really pretty they tend to have a slightly more cooler toned bluish tinge to them like many things with moonlight and they are so so beautiful Another quick point I just want to make here is that these effects are visible in summer as well. You do, um, if you are north of the Arctic Circle, you do get these multi-halo displays that are absolutely fantastic. Sometimes they're caused by ice crystals in the cirrus clouds. Sometimes they're caused by ice crystals in the air called diamond dust. But these effects are, are in clouds that are really high up. So local temperatures, local weather systems do not affect the ability of those clouds to form crystals. Cirrus clouds are the highest clouds we have excluding um, supercell thunder clouds. So up that far up in the atmosphere they're going to be ice regardless of how hot it is down on the ground. So you will get these all year round. The only way that local weather affects them is when you have cirrus stratus clouds on the edges of weather fronts and in that situation you are obviously going to get a halo before the weather changes or as a weather front moves out and changes back from rainy to sunny. So just keep in mind that these are visible all year round from the UK. And while we don't often get very many really truly multi-halo displays, there are atmospheric optics to see almost daily somewhere in the UK. So yeah, don't, don't be put off by the, the approaching summer weather. Now remember when you try to observe these effects, put your hand over the sun don't try to look at the sun directly even with the naked eye i mean to be honest it hurts too much to be able to do it anyway but it is um, going to really damage your eyes if you keep trying to look at it so make sure you protect your eyes at all times if you want to take photographs of them a phone is a great way to do that i take a lot of photographs with my phone of atmospheric optical effects. So in the next video I'm going to talk about some other effects that are still fairly common but maybe not quite as common as the ones in part one. So I'll look forward to talking about that with you in a future video. For now take care, stay safe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.